said, my topic is to do with the analysis, with the um, life course epidemiology. But I know many of you probably know exactly what I mean by life course epidemiology and mediation analysis, which is the other aspect of my talk. But I will spend a few slides just to clarify what do I mean by both of these, life course epidemiology and me uh, mediation methods. So let's see if I can change slides. Yes. So what is life course epidemiology? Well, it is broadly recognized that many acute illnesses and chronic diseases that appear in our lives later in life have origins that come from processes that have happened in very early life, in utero or in childhood or in early adulthood. And uh, this hypothesis, this, uh, this, uh, the first sort of explanation of this connection between early exposures and later adult diseases came with Barker's hypothesis, which drew a link between fetal nutrition experienced um, in the early life and later adult heart disease. And this got quite prominence, even uh, reaching the, uh, the cover of Time magazine in 2010. This hypothesis was then sort of expanded into the Dohat paradigm, the developmental origin of health and, and disease paradigm. And what this paradigm says is that uh, it expands, so shifts the focus from early life in utero exposure to childhood and early adulthood. Not only expands on that relative to the Barker hypothesis, but also ch changes the focus from disease to health in the sense of trying to focus also on factors that may prevent disease, not just understanding the origins of disease. And uh, the sort of the, the beauty and the attraction for a statistical methodologist like me for, for this field is that it has addressing questions in this field, poses very interesting, uh, complex uh, challenges. And this is just a, a very schematic and conceptual diagram of what appeared in the early publications on life course epidemiology. This was a paper by Diana Ku and Ben Shlomo, who in 2003 tried to represent what the, um, in a conceptual diagram, the pathways that link early exposure, early neuter exposure to adult respiratory function. So you see here, if you can see my uh, hand, um, in this box, it represents processes happening in utero, and at the end, here is the outcome, which is the sort of adult uh, lung functions. And all the other arrows and, and boxes indicate possible pathways linking the, these two, these two uh, points. And the pathways are both social and biological, and they interconnect with each other. So you can see the social pathways indicated by B is influenced by biological pathways like childhood chest infection and then filters back into sort of the health of, of the individuals. And so the, this is obviously not a, a comprehensive representation of what goes on, but it, it represents to the conceptual thinking in this field. And this just trying to make sense of this possible relationship poses incredible um, challenges. First of all, the exposures. As you can see, they arise in different periods of the life course. They're often the same exposure, may vary over time. Their influence may also vary over time. So we have time varying effects and we have this interconnection that we have just seen. Say this is sort of the conceptual relationship to think about the data, the data, even the most beautiful cohort studies like the generation R studies and all the co birth cohorts we have in the UK they're still sparse in terms of the relevant timing in which data are collected and uh, behaviors or function or biological um, measurements are, are collected. Not only that, but of course, as uh, cohorts lose individuals through um, um, uh, loss to follow up, they, there is incompleteness, there's missing data, et cetera. So we have a recognition of these complexities, but this this, and the challenges that these are posed. But these are also compounded by the ambition of this field, because the ambition is to answer causal questions. So in the rest of my talk, what I'll try to, 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 to discuss is what sort of causal question can we ask in this field? And what are the limit, what are the, 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 the tools that we should gather and the thinking that we should gather in order to 
contribute to this field. So I will first um, uh, present some simple questions, discuss possible estimates taken from the causal inference literature and work through two examples before summarizing um, my thoughts. So let's reconsider a simplified setting of that Ku and Bonschlomo uh, diagram and consider only two possible exposure, one in infancy and one in childhood. And let's say this is a repeated measure of, of illness in these two time points and our outcome is uh, adult lung function. There are many possible ways in which these two levels of exposure and the outcome can be connected. It could be that uh, it's only the uh, insult in childhood, sorry, the insult in infancy that really drives the adult lung function. Or it could be that it's, acute, that it's only the latter part of, of uh, um, the later exposure time that matters. Or it could be the both matter in, in a cumulative sense. And these are examples of what in life course epidemiology are also referred to as uh, um, critical and cumulative models of um, the origins of disease. But of course, reality is more complex than that. It could be that is, yes, every time exposure matters by one more than the other, or more likely that it could be a, 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 an interaction between these two levels of exposure, th these two levels of exposure, where the, uh, you could hypothesize the children adapt to an earlier exposure in a such a way that when confronted with a later exposure, the, a, a different environment in, in childhood, for example, there could be a synergy between the two levels of exposure. So this is again, the conceptual framework, but how can we discriminate between this alternative explanation using empirical data, empirical evidence? And here comes sort of, uh, sort of causal inference to the rescue, but, and, and the notation of counterfactual uh, outcomes. I'm sure that I don't need to say very much about this to this department, but just to clarify my notation, I'll go through uh, a few elements of it. So the general setting now, instead of referring to exposure in infancy and in childhood and an outcome, I just refer to the two time points as, uh, the two exposure at the two time points as A1 and A2, and I will define potential outcomes linked to this possible exposure. So why little A1 will be the potential outcome when we set the earlier exposure to take that value and why A2 similarly to represent that potential outcome when we set the le level of the second exposure and why A1, A2 will be the potential outcome when we hypothetically intervene on both, um, on both exposure time. Finally, and for, again, for my, the notation I'm going to use next, A2, large A2 with little A1 represent the potential exposure at the second time point that is, would arise had we set the level of the exposure at the first time point. So having defined notation, I'm now just briefly revise uh, some commonly uh, referred to um, estimates in uh, mediation analysis. So, uh, the total causal effect, in, it then can be expressed as a, a contrast between expectations of potential outcomes when we uh, compare a world where everybody is exposed to the level A1 of the exposure one, this is the total causal effect for the first exposure, versus a world where everybody is exposed to the, let's say, baseline level of exposure A1. And then we have the definitions of natural direct and indirect effect. I'll, I'll go quickly because I know you, you know, most of you will have seen all this before, having Tyler as member of the department. Um, the natural direct and indirect effects are now defined in terms of, again, contrast in expectations or potential outcomes, where we either switch on and off the first exposure for the natural direct effect, or we switch on and off the second exposure, but where the second exposure takes the value that would arise when we intervened on the first exposure. So how do we identify these uh, natural direct and indirect effect? Well, we need to invoke several identifying assumptions starting from no interference, consistency for exposure and mediator, as well as no unmeasured confounders for all the relationship between exposure, mediator, mediator and an outcome, exposure and outcome. But in addition, 
to identify these natural effects, we need the assumption of no intermediate confounding, which has been broadly discussed in many contexts. But in the specific examples we are considering here of life course epidemiology, such an assumption is in most situations highly unrealistic, exactly because there are so many pathways that will influence, that will affect the development of the disease through the exposures we're interested in, their downstream um, uh, effects, which will also have some origins with earlier values of the exposure. So although the interpretation of natural direct and indirect effect is very appealing and it's very um, easily um, uh, sort of a, a very broadly uh, used, although not with the same formality in structural equation models, modeling and in the social sciences, because it allows this decomposition of a total effect in this, this two component of natural direct and indirect effect, these estimates are not very useful in the field of life course epidemiology. So what else can we do? Well, Tyler van der Veel with um, others, uh, including Van Stielen and, and, and Robbins, suggested changing the focus to what uh, they call randomized intervention no analogs of the natural effects. They're less ambitious for reasons that we will see. Uh, and the, the, they differ in the sense that instead of considering hypothetical worlds where we intervene on both exposures, so now obviously the second exposure in this framework act as a mediator, but I'm still thinking in terms of a second exposure in, in my life course um, scenario, we, we are thinking not of intervening on these the two uh, exposure, we're thinking of intervening on the first exposure and then looking at the how we could change the distribution of the second one. And I try to write this in, in a general format here, which the, these sort of interventional effects are defined in terms of potential outcomes which have this nature. Sorry, I should, I should not have the expectation here. I should just say what sort of potential outcome I'm considering here. And I'm looking at the general definition where uh, the both exposures can be uh, thought of as continuous. So we think of a potential outcome where we may intervene on the first exposure, adding or not a term, so making into a switching in on and off in some form, like going from zero, one, or increasing by one standard deviation. And for the second exposure, we instead draw a, 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 a realization of its distribution had the first exposure be set to a particular value. And here, the particular value could be the baseline value, a one, or could be a shift uh, into exposure status, for example, or adding one standard deviation uh, with the value S2. Graphically, this can be seen as this. So this will be the distribution of A2 and uh, um, the distribution of the second exposure, A2, when the first exposure is set to the sort of some baseline value. And the dotted red line represent the shift in that distribution that may occur had we set the first exposure to a different value. So having visualized this, let's look at the formal definition of this interventional effects. You can see that, so they look quite cumbersome, but in fact, all they say is that we are comparing alternative worlds where either we intervene on the first exposure and we draw a sample of, for the second exposure from its distribution under a hypothetical, uh, in the absence of exposure for the first exposure. That seems confusing, but I should probably stick to A1 and A2, under no exposure for A1. And the indirect effect is a setting where we leave the first A1 to keep at the same value, but then we switch on and off the distribution. We, we change the distribution of A2. The beauty of these definitions is that we can identify them with a basic assumption I defined before, but without the requir requirement of no intermediate confounding. And in that sense, they will uh, they have the advantages of being available to us, obviously, if the other assumptions are met for uh, life course investigation. And the interpretation of these effects is that there are contrasts focus on manipulating the mediator in, or the distribution of A2. Uh, 
The downside is that the sum is not the total causal effect, but usually they're very close and we could discuss this in, as a small disadvantage or a large disadvantage. But one major advantage is that uh, it generalized nicely to multiple mediator setting and uh, Van Stielen and Daniel have done this uh, and we will, I will show it, uh, some example, some results from that. If we are not happy though to think of intervening on the first exposure, on, the, on A1, we could consider other estimates. And these are the counterfactual disparity measures also um, belonging to the work, uh, ra ra rises starting from the work of, of Carla van der Veel and Robinson and then picked up by Naimi and others. So if we are not seeking a causal interpretation with respect to, the, to A1, there is another al alternative definition uh, that may be of interest and it's the counterfactual disparity measure defined here where you see that we are only uh, setting uh, intervene on A2 while leaving A1 to an, uh, an observed value, either exposed or not exposed. The identification is even sort of more relaxed, let's say, that uh, the interventional effect, where we are just focusing on uh, uh, assumptions referring to A2, and the interpretation uh, which comes here is the amount of uh, association between the original, between A1 and the outcome, that uh, would remain where we in a position of intervening on A2 and maybe set, set it to a distribution which is favorable. Now I'm going to introduce something maybe we are less familiar with, which is a combination of these two, and these are the interventional disparity measure. This is a variation of the counterfactual disparity measure that I've just uh, showed you, but it incorporates the ideas of interventional effects. And this was proposed in a paper to which I contributed by Nadia Mikali, but the real sort of brain behind these definitions is Fri and Daniel, who developed uh, sort of the, um, the methodological aspects of this. But let me describe what the interventional disparity measures are. First of all, in terms of direct effects. So you can see the format is the same as what we have just seen in terms of counterfactual disparity measures, where we condition on observed levels of the um, first exposure, either say exposed versus not exposed, but we have replaced a particular value set for A2 to a random draw from the distribution of A2 under certain favorable conditions. The interpretation of this direct um, interventional uh, disparity measure is, would be is the association that would remain if we would, were intervening on A to, 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 if we intervene on the distribution of A2. The, we can also define an interventional disparity measure for the indirect effect. And then again, you can, you can see very nicely what we are doing here. We are just switching the distribution of A2 while conditioning, looking only at those who are exposed in, uh, in A1. And the interpretation is the extent to which the outcome in those not exposed to A1, which would be um, the, uh, this group here, would change had to be drawn from the distribution of those exposed to A1, which are these. The identification for both interventional disparity measures are weaker than uh, assumption than for interventional effects in the same way in which the uh, counterfactual, the simpler version that I just described are. And there is this, this beautiful generalization to multiple mediators, which has a potential again to give us tools for life course epidemiology. So this brings it to the end of my introduction of the choice of estimates we have to the, while facing questions which arise in life course epidemiology. And I'll start with my first motivating example, which comes from eating disorder in adolescence, uh, which is an area which I've been working in uh, since moving to, the, to uh, the Institute of Child Health. Eating disorders, as probably you know, are associated with greater body size from birth and to, to childhood. And there could be many explanations for this, both in terms of self-awareness and in terms of uh, probably some, maybe even uh, some um, behavioral uh, um, uh, propensity to, to, co to control or not control 
uh, you're eating. And schematically, uh, using the same sort of diagram I used before, we, I could just say there is sort of some early exposure, some later exposure, and an outcome here. And we have data from the from ALSPAC, the Able uh, Longitudinal Study of Parents of Children, which is a birth cohort um, from the west, southwest of, uh, of the UK. We have data on um, some uh, questionnaire about uh, eating, about, about attitude to food, and from which a binge eating score uh, was derived and standardized. And this, uh, this questionnaire was de delivered to the children when they were 13. And the exposure we have are all the sort of biological measures of birth weight and BMI uh, yearly from age seven to age uh, 12. And this should appear uh, in, in the next few slides. To start with, I will just consider two exposures, two points of exposure, uh, as I've sort of my um, description has been so far. So I will just choose birth weight as my, sorry, my first point of exposure and a BMI measured at age 12 and my second point of exposure. And I will now uh, estimate first interventional effects um, by, and this may be debatable to some of you, by imagining that I could intervene both on birth weight and on, on BMI in ways which are defensible in the sense that my uh, interventions are, are well defined. And for birth weight in particular, this may be doubtful. And that's why we will move on to other estimates. But let's first uh, think about how we can estimate this interventional effect. Of course, if we use, I should also stress that in this setting, uh, when I am estimating this uh, effect, but I will be using G computation by uh, Monte Carlo simulations, I'm also allowing for unmeasured confounding between the intermediate confounders. First, I should stress that my L indicates intermediate confounding, and I'm allowing here for BMI at an earlier time to act as such intermediate confounder. And this is pretty defensible, I think, that there will be an influence from birth weight here and onto BMI and the outcome. But in, in my setting, I'm also allowing for my, my I, I could sort of, I'm quite satisfied that I will meet me as my assumption of no unmeasured confounding needed here because I'm also, I know that I, there can be unmeasured confounding between the intermediate confounder and the outcome. So in this setting, now I'm going to estimate the total, um, the, this measure uh, from, in, uh, the, the, from the interventional effect, which is will be the total effect of birth weight on, on the eating scores. Remember, eating score is continuous, it's a standardized score. And the total effect is practically pretty small. It's about 5% of the standard deviation in this particular score. But it partitions into, a, um, if we believe the assumptions, into a direct and indirect uh, intervention, direct and indirect effect, so, sort of sort of splitting the, into two halves between an effect is mediated through BMI at 12 and, uh, and an effect that involves other pathway, including this uh, as well as this pathway. Now, I may, uh, how do I interpret these, these measures? Well, the interventional direct effect, I'm just checking the time, would say that shifting the birth weight by one standard deviation, which is my uh, exposure, while holding the distribution of BMI constant, will lead to an increase in binge eating by that amount. The interventional indirect effect says shifting the distribution of BMI at 12 by the same amount as if birth weight had shifted while holding birth weight fixed will lead to an increase of binge eating. So not so easy to, to describe, but maybe easier to imagine that we are comparing worlds where we set birth weight and we look at the impact of shifting somehow the distribution of BMI. If you weren't happy to uh, think of uh, uh, um, intervening on birth weight, we may adopt a second bunch of estimates I've introduced to you, which is the interventional disparity measure. I would get the same estimate, the same values, but I would interpret them differently. And in this case, I would say that the interpretation of 0 0.024 now is that shifting the distribution of BMI at, at 12 but the same amount as if birth weight had been reduced by one standard deviation, 
would reduce the association between the observed association between birth weight and um, eating binge eating scores by about two and a half percent. So you can see that sort of the, 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 the reasoning is because I cannot uh, avoid having intermediate confounders, I adopt different estimates, but these estimates are slightly more complex to interpret. But um, that's, I, I will say more about this in my conclusions. But now, so my example was very simplified. I'm actually, um, actually have data on multiple repeated measurements of BMI. So I should exploit all the measurements. And the first thing I could do is to calculate interventional effect where I treat all these measurements of BMI as my mediator, as joint mediators. And I would imagine shifting the distribution of all these mediators as this little sort of figures show you by the amount corresponding to say reduce this birth weight by one standard deviation and what do i find there i find that there is a, a larger indirect effect a larger sort of portion of the association that would be reduced if we could do that and shift the whole distribution of the mi now uh, I could also use the generalization of the interventional effect that I described earlier from um, the work by um, Ria and Daniel. We could actually split the contribution of these multiple mediators into components. And for example, I could concentrate on the earlier life, the earlier um, BMI measurements and say, what is the impact of early body mass index? versus later and the interventional effects have sub, uh, the, with multiple mediators are quite complicated interpretation that I, we could discuss later but suffice it to say in this example because these mediators are ordered in time and order causally i can interpret the uh, interventional um, disparity inter indirect interventional disparity measure involving only early growth as uh, as this measure, this est estimate that I obtain as the sort of the interventional mediator effect that it works through the first set of mediators or earlier pathways. So there isn't very much, that's the conclusion, that happens in the earlier part uh, of the development of, 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 of a child um, towards developing uh, binge eating problems. So early growth is the conclusion on its own, does, does not seem to contribute to the effect of shifting the joint distribution of BMI. But now again, I'm criticizing my analysis by saying, well, I could do better than that because I have such richness data and I'm ignoring the fact that each individual BMI measurement is actually done quite potentially quite poorly. And the, I have statistical models that allow me to separate the measurement error of each of these point, time point observation from the essence of the growth trajectories. So now I'm replacing those observed mediators with two latent variables, which I call BMI size and BMI velocity, which are obviously correlated with each other. And that's what these gray lines represent through some measure confounders that will be correlated. But these two latent variables are manifested by the observed BMI that we have used before. Now, I, I reapply the interventional effects, um, um, the multiple with multiple mediators definitions, and I find this decomposition of the indirect of interventional disparity measure, which is indirect. I find that actually between the two latent variables is size that dominates, that contributes to that um, indirect effect. So if I could shift size as much as, uh, the, if I could shift the distribution of size according to a change in birth weight, I would reduce that association by more than half. While velocity, which is the rate of increase uh, of BMI in childhood between seven and 12 does not seem to con contribute very much. And this seems to contradict my earlier results that early BMI measurements were not very informative. But if, you know, if, if one sort of thinks about what I, I'm sure many of you know about sort of trajectories of BMI in childhood during that period, seven to 12, the 
the trajectory is quite linear. That's why I used only two latent variables there with size and velocity and non, no other uh, non-linear terms. But also uh, it says we, we know that there's a lot of tracking in BMI. So size really captures what is the essence of that growth. And that's that underlying trajectories of growth that really appears to influence uh, our outcome. So latent size seems to be the most important feature. Now I'll move on to criticizing again my work and say, well, I've achieved that in those estimates by deriving those latent dimensions using a linear growth model, or in fact, a, a linear mixed effects model. And from those models, I derive my best linear uh, unbiased predictions of those random intercept and random slope. That's what that size and velocity are. But those are not, and I've treated them in my calculation, estimation of the um, interventional disparity of effect as if they were observed data. Of course, they're not observed. I have accounted for that in my inference because I've allowed for the fact that the, uh, by bootstrapping, I allowed the estimation of those random effects to, to add noise to my inference. But conceptually, I have really use them as if they were observed. So I've not accounted for the fact that they are probably measured with the individual predictions are affected by measurement error. This may not, doesn't seem to be a great problem as I've sort of, um, as we will see in a moment. Well, this may be a problem or not, but certainly that brought me to worry about uh, the fact that if your latent variable is continuous, you would expect some noise, but a pretty uh, um, non-differential noise. But if you have a latent variable which is categorical or binary, we know that, that later, if I use the same procedure of predicting the class or predicting the, that the latent variable, I know I would have non-differential error because the truth, if it's a binary variable, either you're wrong or you're right. And if you're wrong, the error is negative and the other way around. So it, it's a non-differential non error. So it's a differential error, that's what I mean. So that's, that thought brought me to worry about my second example. And this is an example again to do with childhood health, but the opposite of eating disorder, this is to do with childhood BMI. And there is now some, uh, some evidence, although not very strong evidence, that uh, food insecurity may be related to childhood BMI, where by food insecurity really is, is another way of calling po food poverty. And it's been suggested um, in, in recent years that the process, that the, the mechanism through, through which food, in, food insecurity may influence um, and, and lead to increased childhood BMI is to do with the attitude to food, the, 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 uh, the way in which food is chosen and, uh, uh, and eaten and, and finished and, and treated. And so this diagram represents this potential scenario where food insecurity may lead to feeding practices, which may lead to childhood BMI. And here again, we've got data from ALSPAC. It's a separate project, therefore we, uh, we cannot sort of compare or, or relate the results between binge eating and, uh, um, and, and BMI at 12 in terms of, uh, of feeding practices. But we have now data, questionnaire data on parental feeding practices when uh, the children were 10. Sorry, I forgot to write this. And we will proxy food insecurity and, and sort of, uh, poverty with a binary indicator of maternal education, where we have about half, where we are treated as a binary indicator, a binary variable with a high or a higher maternal education being the, uh, an indicator of exposure. So higher maternal education will lead to lower BMI. And now we uh, just as a so a, a point of, of what are we talking about? We are talking about changes in BMI, which are on, on average about 19 kilograms per square meter. We have used the data on parental or on, uh, from the questionnaire on uh, uh, attitude, uh, parental feeding practices, which were questions in terms of how the children had access to, to sweet, how often they were 
favorably give, given favorite food, how they were controlling their quantity of food, and uh, if they ever commented on their size, on how much they ate. And from these indicators, we identified three latent classes of increasing control. So the uh, class number three, which is about 30% uh, of, of predicted of, of, of the children, had high, especially uh, had scored high on, on, on the question the child would eat too much, but also quite high on putting the food out of reach of the children and uh, commenting on, on, on weight. And this is avoiding too many sweets. So we've used this latent class as our um, mediator uh, using um, as a mediator, but now we are trying to discuss whether using the predictions from this latent class model as, a, uh, as our mediator will introduce some error because we know that there will be misclassification error in attributing a class when individual participants in the study. So th this is a concern, but uh, how can we address the question of misclassification error in our mediation analysis? Well, the SAM literature, the structural equation um, modeling literature, will offer possible solutions to this. And, and, uh, and in, in general, there are three suggested solutions. Now, this is a diagram that represents sort of the SEM way of thinking. In the SEM way of thinking, you can represent what I've just described to you as a problem where the mediator, the latent class, is manifested by these scores, um, by these um, questionnaire re answer, uh, um, responses. And we have six of these responses. And what it's until recently commonly done in mediation analysis in, in the SEM literature is to estimate a, a model jointly where the, the measurement part of the, what they call the measurement part of the model is modeled jointly with the structural part of the model, which is so the, the ones relating to the causal relationship between these variables. There is a problem, however, with this approach. And the, the problem is that, as you can see, the latent class is identified by its relationship with the manifest variables. But when we fit a model like this, we cannot separate the arrows pointing to Y1 to Y6 to the arrow pointing to the outcome. So if we fitted this model jointly, we would treat the outcome itself as a manifestation of the latent, out, of the, of the latent class. And therefore, this by itself would change the interpretation of the latent class. So this is not a way uh, to proceed because this may alter the interpretation of the classes. There are two alternatives to doing this. It, again, from the SEM literature is to adjust for the misclassification bias using a three-step procedure, or, um, and uh, the details are here, or using a, less known, but in my view, much, clear, um, much useful, very useful simplification of this adjusting um, uh, adjustment procedure. Uh, just so that um, I sort of explain this fully, this bias adjusted step simply splits the, the steps in this estimation into first, uh, so doing it in a naive way, estimate, like I did in, in my analysis of the uh, eating disorder um, example, first concentrate on the latent variable, then replace the latent variable with the prediction and proceed to the estimation. But, and this will be step one and step two in this, uh, in, in this bias adjustment method. But there's a third step, which is the step of correcting for the misclassification, which is new to what I did before. The nice thing of the two-step method is that this is the, uh, the second step in a way is, is it, you can avoid the second step and achieve the same, the, same as, this, the same result. So this is what I've done now with this example. We have this parental control, feeding control here, which is a latent variable. And I have used the two-step method to correct for the misclassification of that class. And these are the results I will obtain. So very slowly, and, and then I'm, I'm to nearly the end of my talk. The total um, 
association now because I'm using interventional disparity measure interpretation of my results. The total association between the maternal education, being high maternal education BMI is to reduce the BMI by about 0.2. And about, and, but if we could intervene on uh, parental attitudes to con uh, parental control on, on feeding practices of the children, uh, in a way that um, that reflects what um, high maternal education does, would reduce. Sorry, no. This is. Uh, I should have used the the other direction of effect. Sorry. Um, let me start again uh, because I'm using the negatives here. So the maternal high maternal education reduces BMI. If we changed uh, the um, the behavior uh, of the parents in a way like as if they were lower maternal uh, education, we would reduce that advantage of um, reducing the BMI by about a, a quarter. I think I would have explained this better if everything was positive. And I would say if we could change the control to the behavior of high educated mother, we would reduce the harmful effect of BMI. But I think you can see what I'm saying. We can explain some of that association away if we could intervene on the mediator and correct in the, in the appropriate way. So shifting the distribution of the latent class, but the same amount um, or the, at a higher education will reduce the association. But I, I com, I'm sort of confusing myself by putting the negative. But the whole point is that these results are, um, so before I say that, these results allow us to say something about intervening on the mediator by, con by considering the shift in distribution of the mediators in a way that is sensible. Maybe we, we need to think now how we can change that distribution. That would be a, an, another question may call for in a randomized control trial where we can see whether we can shift that distribution, but we could then say that we are trying to ameliorate the impact of low maternal education on, on BMI. Now I've given all this, all this description, and I want you to finish off with a bang and say, oh, look how bad the results are if I ignore the misclassification. Actually, the results were very similar. And the reason is that my, I was so lucky that my latent class model had a fantastic entropy, had a 97% entropy. So there was very little misclassification error. But in conclusions, in conclusion, the whole sort of 40 minutes or so that I've dedicated to this, my main points, uh, the main points I wanted to relate to you were the life course in epidemiology aims to understand the effects of lifetime exposures on health and especially to suggest, wants to suggest intervention to improve health. This is the realm of causal inference. However, our ability to perform such in causal investigations is constrained by the often unrealistic assumptions that are needed to address these questions. Interventional effects, and in particular dispar the disparity measure version of them, have the potential of addressing some useful question. Of course, they're not the same as we wish, but we need to be realistic. And uh, finally, the challenges posing by including later dimension in our investigations should not be ignored. Although my example does not sort of prove, doesn't make a point of proving this, I'm sure you will agree that there are many other settings where you may want to summarize the information into a latent dimension, or you have misclassification error of some sort. That misclassification will certainly impact on your results in, in, as it's been discussed in many papers. Finally, thank you very much. This is working in collaboration with Andrew Pickles, Moritz Hell, and Daniel Thompson. Thank you.